Welcome to Classic Rock Pencil, one of my worst to best videos, and today we're looking at Emerson, Lake and Palmer. But before we get started, I urge you to click like, subscribe and check that bell. And check some of the links below this video for ways you can support the sterling work done here at Classic Album Review. Become a patron, there's a fine body work on my Patreon now, make a donation, check out the Amazon wishlist, or simply like the Facebook page, it's all good and all much appreciated. This is a much anticipated and requested video, so enough of the flim flam, let's get straight into it. Number 11 is To The Power Of Three from 1988. To be honest with you, I don't really consider this an ELP album because ultimately it isn't, but nevertheless it deserves a place in the ELP narrative and that place is at the bottom of this list. The three on this album are Emerson Palmer and Robert Berry. It's an album that does not sound like an Emerson Lake and Palmer album, it doesn't even sound like a prog album, it does actually sound more like To Pow than Emerson Lake and Palmer. It's an album firmly and horribly rooted in those 1980s production affectations, has to be said, uh, that simply pollute a lot of great music from this time. Uh, David Gilmore was quite right to go back and rescue a momentary lapse from reason, um, de 85 it, so to speak. But this one, I think, is perhaps beyond hope. This album feels more like AOR pop to me, and the less said about the Birds cover, the better. Number 10 on my list is In the Hot Seat from 1994. You're probably thinking at this juncture, if Love Beach is rated in your 10 worst prog albums, how come uh, it's above this one in this list? These two albums, uh, in terms of their awfulness, there's only a fag paper between them. So for today, I'm gonna to go with this one as the ultimate Emerson, Lake and Palmer stink if it wins out to Love Beach by a, a smidgen. The band, while they were making this one, were just running on fumes. I mean, the speculation, it was made just to fulfill a contractual obligation. Even uh, Carl Palmer, I think, has dismissed this album as dreadful. The album suffers from a lack of creative impetus and ideas, there's no doubt about that. And it seems to me that Keith Olsen has no feel for this music, or no feel at all for the Emerson, Lake and Palmer legacy. The production on this album makes the music feel very contained and reined in when Emerson, Lake and Palmer were at their very best, when they were cinematic and sweeping in their grandeur. Interestingly, Mark Lauren of All Music has stated of this album that it falls short on so many levels and not even the talents of the three phenomenal musicians can save it. And even Kiefer Olsen went on to say that he regretted producing this album, saying that it had no songs, no preparation and no work ethic. Number nine is Love Beach from 1978. This is now dominated by Greg Lake and the more romantic leaning tunage for those cosy prog nights in with your nearest and dearest. Some argue of course that the, the Works was a disjointed album. You could say of Love Beach of course that they are at least singing from the same hymn sheet. As I said before it's just the wrong hymn sheet. Many of the songs are concise and accessible and you can see how that might appeal to people. It lacks I think the, the grandeur of ELP at its uh, cinematic best. We do get that epic uh, memoirs of an officer and a gentleman, but nevertheless, it's an album where Keith Emerson seems considerably diminished in favor of Greg Lake's own interpretation of the shifts and trends of the time as the good ship ELP is sailed perilously close to Fair Isle Cardis and Chinos. And Carl Palmer, rather than the molten presence he has been on those uh, earlier albums, just keeps a rather steadying beat a sort of a tit bum tit approach to playing the drums whilst uh, which conveniently allows him to gaze at his watch as he trudges through this material. On this album we were invited down to Love Beach. Well you know to be honest with you I don't mind being taken down to Strawberry Fields or even Paradise City or a dark desert highway where the warm smell of Kalitas rises up through the air but to be invited down to Love Beach by three open shirted tight trousered proggers not on your Nelly. Number eight is Black Moon from 1992. Uh, Jim Allen said that the original trio's first studio album in a dozen years suffers from the inevitable aging and darkening of Lake's voice and the lack of real impetus. ELP return of a um, kind of a stripped back sound on this album, I feel, and even Keith Emerson's uh, classic analog synthesizer sound seems to be replaced with more modern sounding gadgetry. And all those prog interpretations of classical grandeur seem to be stripped down to bite-sized chunks. Standout moments on this album are rather like the ballad, uh, Affairs of the Heart, Footprints in the Snow is good, but the best piece is that uh, interpretation of Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet. As I said in the opening quote, Greg Lake's voice is clearly darkened with age, but at least this album has some purpose behind it. Number seven is Emerson, Lake and Powell from 1986. 
I believe Carl Palmer was unavailable for this one. I think he had touring duties with uh, Asia. I think they were promoting their Astra album. So they hired Cozy Powell to take the pee in terms of the brand. No disrespect to Cozy Powell, who's an immense drummer, but I think they just figured that uh, the band at the end of the day were more or less gravitated around the keyboard pyrotechnics of Keith Emerson. But they were wrong, of course, because the brilliance of ELP is this perfect symbiosis between those three key members. This uh, wonderful prog morphing, if you like. A bit like the Trilogy album cover, in fact. And we get lots of uh, Greg Lake's soulful voice and layered guitar patterns. And on a good day, uh, I would rank this album a little bit higher, perhaps. Perhaps up there with the works. Uh, but today's not a good day, so it uh, languishes here. Standout tracks would have to be, you know, the score, Touch and Go, Love Blind, that's this band Grapple with what could be best described as almost new wave textures. The cover of Holst's um, The Bringer of Mars, The Bringer of War is intriguing, especially as King Crimson used to do it themselves way back in 69. I think they used to introduce Epitaph with it when uh, actually Greg Lake was a member. Number six is The Works, Volume 2 from 1977. This is a rather eclectic album with a variation of musical styles, of course, including some rather handsomely orchestrated renditions of things like Maple Leaf Rag, Honky Tonk Train Blues and Show Me The Way To Go Home, with the odd scattering of uh, late tunes as well. And like any good ELP album, there's some uh, intriguing and mind-bending uh, instrumental stuff on here as well. And of course, Peter Seinfeld contributes some of the lyrics. This is his pre Bucks Fizz days, by the way. Lyrics made uh, even more poignant by the adding of uh, Blake's rich, mellifluous voice. Emerson's work on here is solid, explorative, remarkable stuff that he, he does. Uh, we get five instrumentals on this album, and Keith Emerson's work here is solid and explorative. Uh, in, we get the fascinating jazzy bullfrog. Um, uh, the Barrel House Shakedown, Maple Leaf Rag, I've already mentioned, provide a perfect platform for Emerson's honky tonk piano. We get some nice surgical and swirling electric guitar on here, which is uh, interesting on an Emerson Lake and Palmer album. Brain Salad Surgery is an interesting number, has this very jazzy prog feel to it. Uh, I uh, often wonder if they're kind of doffing a cap a little bit to uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers here. But it also bears an uncanny resemblance to the King Crimson number Cat Food. Of course, a single, I think the band, I think it was a single, that the band put out whilst Greg Lake was in situ. And on this one, we do get the I Believe in Father Christmas, that lush uh, orchestration of that one, written by Greg Lake and Peter Seinfeld, of course, uh, with, punctuated by uh, flashes of Prokofiev. Number five is The Works, Volume 1 from 1977. So our three prog musketeers, tired of being seen as this uh, progressive splodge, decided to uh, venture out, spread their wings, and produce some solo LPs. Uh, however, it kind of an umagummer affair, if you like. Uh, however, it hadn't um, worked out commercially that well for, for Yes, so they decided perhaps it was best to operate it beneath the security blanket that was the ELP brand. We get Keith Emerson's excellent piano concerto, especially played on that large Steinway piano and uh, accompanied by the London Philharmonic Orchestra. It's a dramatic and cinematic work, uh, aided, I think, by uh, John Mayer, who, of course, was on board for this one. But it uh, beautifully showcases how brilliant Keith Emerson was. And Greg Lake channels his inner Jim Croce with some beautiful romantic uh, acoustic musings. C'est la vie, have your leaves all turned to brown. What a beautiful refrain that is. However, actually, it's uh, Carl Palmer's side that I find rather intriguing. Uh, aided, of course, by the wonderful guitar flourishes of Joe Walsh. And the two very stylish and ornate numbers on here, which I enjoy, Pirates and Fanfare for a Common Man. Copeland's hoedown had been very successful for them, especially live, so they probably figured uh, Fanfare would sit well for them also. Number four is Tarkas from 1971. Bertrand Russell said war doesn't determine who is right, only who is left. And this album, or this title track, I should say, could be seen very much as a meditation on such matters. The Tankadillo cover is very striking, designed by William Neal, who's gone on to say that it is a commentary on the futility of war. The name, in fact, is an amalgam of Tartarus and Carcass. Tartarus is the, um, is the deep abyss, a dungeon of torment and suffering. Sounds a bit like daytime TV. And, of course, we get Carcass which explains why the title of the album is spelt out in these discarded bones. This title track is packed with images of apocalyptic destruction. Uh, it's like um, something from Revelations, or the Johnny Cash songbook, perhaps. The title track follows the progress of Tarkas from birth to his battle with the Manticore. 
to um, which he loses and it concludes with an aquatic version of Tarkus named Aquatarkus. It all gets very uh, surreal. But I generally think this uh, title track is absolutely remarkable. In fact, it features in my video, Top 10 Prog Epics. If you haven't checked that one out, please do so. Keith Emerson said uh, he was uh, one of the tracks he was most proud of. Let's not forget this 21 minute prog epic. Beats Genesis, uh, Supper's Ready, and Yes is Close to the Edge by a Year. I think Tarkus is a remarkable work. However, the album as a whole, in my opinion, is um, let down by the, some of the tracks on the second side. Number three is Trilogy, How Appropriate, from 1972. Greg Lake has actually gone on record as saying this is his favorite ELP record. The Hypnosis album cover depicts the three faces melding into one, emblematic of the merging of these three immense talents. This album lacks the chaos and the raw energy of the debut album, and it lacks the, the menace of brain salad surgery. But what it does have is a kind of maturity and balance, something I fear Tarkus lacked. This was their fourth album in two years and their first studio album after the Sublime Pictures and Exhibition, which is one of my favorites. It's not featured in this ranking video, of course, because it's a, effectively a live album recorded at the Newcastle City Hall, if I'm not mistaken. This album's fairly accessible, like the debut, almost as if the band could rest on its laurels a little bit uh, comfortable in the knowledge they had uh, established themselves within the prog collective. Greg Lake's acoustic ballad from the beginning did very well for them, as well as a superb adaptation of Aaron Copeland's Hoedown, which was, uh, of course was a live favorite. But it's the three part, the Endless Enigma trilogy, which stand out sensational, strong, uh, edgy, but nicely paced compositions. Eddie Offord's uh, production is worth noting here. It provides a lush and enveloping sound, which is very much part of this album as anything else. Trilogy has been meticulously thought out and that's very much apparent in the arrangements Some wonderful guitar work, percussion and brilliant uh, keyboard playing by uh, Keith Emerson. Some of the synth work on this is excellent. Number two is Brain Salad Surgery from 1973. William Shatner said progressive rock was the science fiction of music and I kind of agree with him. This album is the perfect symbiosis of uh, bombast and brilliance, a record that takes its title from a lyric in a Dr. John song. Carnival 9 has volume and vengeance, it has a hair standing up on the back of your neck, it's a evocative and nightmarish delving. The working title of this album was Whip Some Skull On You, which, is, uh, which really did suck as it was a reference to fellatio. Of course the um, record company were never going to allow that which I think the band found rather hard to swallow. But this theme was also incorporated in the H.R. Giger artwork, which had to have the phallus airbrushed out, kind of deboning, if you will. On any given day, I would consider this ELP's finest album. Uh, for me, there's a fag paper between this one and their debut record. But this is a definitive contribution to the progressive rock genre. There's, there's no doubt about that. It's uh, certainly an ambitious record. It's a rather hard sounding album though, I don't think it was just me, but I find something specifically icy about it. Carnival 9 is the standout track on this album and appeals to a lot of metal fans. We get the obligatory acoustic number Still You Turn Me On, sung wonderfully by Greg Lake. We can almost forgive him for that rhyming triplet. Uh, Every day a little sadder, a little madder, someone get me a ladder. That last lyric is a bit of a climb to be honest with you. The production and sound quality on this record is astounding. It positively shimmers with a steely and unsettling vibe. Number one is ELP, the debut album from 1970, this absolute masterpiece. This album or Brain Salad Surgery could easily be in the number one spot on any given day for me, to be honest with you. I mean, some have expressed a preference for that psychedelically quirky Tankadillo album, but for me it's this one, it perfectly blends melody, songwriting and classical ambitions. I think this album has a raw and powerful energy. You know, from the chilling opener, The Barbarian and The Three Fates, which incidentally wouldn't sound out of place on a nice album in my opinion, as well as the whimsical and plaintive Lucky Man, which was a kind of an acoustic throwaway, uh, which is elevated by uh, Keith Emerson's keyboard pyrotechnics at the end. You know, it shows the beginnings of some imposingly dark textures, gothic in fact. Uh, courtesy of Emerson's larger than life organ, cue dirty Sid James laugh at that point, as well as the melodicism and understanding of song structure. The interaction between these three exceptional musicians is, is just absolutely remarkable on, on this album. Impressive licks, classical arpeggios, all thrown in with uncanny ease. You know, we have to note the incendiary drumming by Carl Palmer and the, the beautiful, sublime tone of Greg Legg's voice. Uh, note his pitch perfect warblings when he was uh, with King Crimson. 
and Take a Pebble and Lucky Man are imbued with this wistful beauty. A third of the tracks on this album are interpretations of classical pieces. Of course, The Barbarian is based on a piece by Bartok. Knife Edge, which is my the f best song on this album, in my opinion, is actually based on Janacek's Sinfonietta. Knife Edge is just devastatingly beautiful, that very moody and deadpan vocal delivery by Greg Lake. And of course you have to speak of uh, Keith Emerson's contribution to this album, which is dark, imposing, and as I said, gothic. This album is raw, powerful, bombastic, brilliant, I never tire of listening to it. Anyway, that's my personal ranking of the Emerson, Lake and Palmer albums. If you've gotten to this point without switching off, I thank you for doing just that. Do check out some of the cards that are appearing, uh, should be appearing around about now. Um, do click like, subscribe and check that notification bell. And other than that, make sure you're staying safe and well and healthy. But more importantly, of course, that you're, you keep listening. <laughs>